So Anita Posh is uh, one of our local uh, one of our local Bitcoin crypto people. She's um, in the Vorstand or the board of directors of Bitcoin Austria, and so glad to welcome to welcome you to our community of Parallel Polis. And I'm incredibly excited to hear about your experiences in Zimbabwe and Botswana about how Bitcoin is actually working down there when you go and talk to people. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, and I'm going to start right off with my presentation. Yeah. So uh, I went to Zimbabwe and Botswana in February this year, just right before this uh, coronavirus pandemic hit us in Europe and now also in Africa. And um, I went there because I wanted to see from the ground uh, or on the ground how Bitcoin is used in these countries. Is it really, is it even used? Uh, because most times when uh, people speak about uh, Bitcoin's properties being permissionless, uncensorable, uh, open, transparent, uh, international, global money, uh, we say that the perfect use cases are actually in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. But uh, I never heard from anyone who really has been to Zimbabwe and has uh, investigated this and looked into it. Is it true or is it not? So uh, this was the reason why I went there. And um, in the next 40 minutes about, I'm t talking to you, or I'm telling you what I've experienced, how the living situation is for people in Zimbabwe how it is to live in a multi-currency world where you are used to use many different uh, forms of money and currencies. Uh, the different forms of money that are used there, like mobile money, and uh, it's a complete broken banking system, uh, I was told, and also the human rights situation we have a small look at. And uh, also, if we want to use Bitcoin, of course, of course, need internet access. We're going to have a look at that. And also uh, in, into the, the state of using Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in Zimbabwe. Anita, if I can interrupt for a moment, it looks sure. to me like, your, um, like your, the, your screen orientation is in portrait mode rather than landscape mode. So we're getting your slide really small. Are you serving it from an iPad or from an iPhone? Um, no, but from, uh, wait, wait a minute. Um, because if you look at, if you click on, on your own screen, you'll see that it's showing like it, it, it yeah. Shall I, shall I try to start it again? I have no idea why it's, why it's displaying like that. I do, but I'm trying to, um, okay. Wait a minute. Just a second. You can go out of screen sharing and then change the application mm -hmm. or, or whatever it is that you think is doing that. Yeah. Okay. Wait a moment. Sorry. No problem. Um, I was like zooming in and trying to read the text and that'll kind of like be a bummer for YouTube. This is better. No, this is, what? there we go. Yes. Yes. Okay. There great. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Great. So. Just, sorry, just give me a second. Have I lost you now? Hello? No, no, no. Okay, 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 okay. So now every, everything, everything is fine now. Okay, so uh, that are the reasons why I went to Zimbabwe. And uh, at the beginning, I want to introduce myself. Just, uh, you did that very kind. Um, I'm a Bitcoin and co podcaster. I'm also an independent educator and the author of a Bitcoin book in German for newbies. And as you said, I am a board member of Bitcoin Austria. And I'm actually very proud that I'm also one of the translators of Andreas Antonopoulos' uh, books, The Internet of Money to German. So, um, that also gives you a kind of a feeling um, why I'm why I set out to go to Zimbabwe because I'm really interested in Bitcoin as a tool for freedom of transaction for banking the unbanked, but as well as uh, 
unbank the bank, but as a tool for financial inclusion. And that's also what Andreas is uh, always saying. So that's why there's a, a connection with him for me. So I set out uh, to go to Zimbabwe and to Gaborón in Botswana. Um, why did I even go to Zimbabwe? Um, I have a friend living there because uh, without having a friend there who shows you uh, where to go, how to go, uh, it's quite difficult uh, to be a tourist in Zimbabwe. And then I also visited Gaborone because there uh, Alakani Itirileng uh, is living. She is the founder of the Satoshi Center in Botswana, uh, which is uh, active since 2014. And she's a real OG and I wanted to talk with her too. So in February, at the beginning, I uh, flew to Harare. Uh, I don't know if you know, Zimbabwe is in southern, in, in the south of Africa, uh, north of South Africa, and uh, Botswana is uh, south of uh, uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a country with 16 million inhabitants. Harare is the capital of uh, Zimbabwe, and they have about 1.8 million inhabitants, like the same uh, as Vienna. Um, and uh, I was lucky to be able to give a Bitcoin basics talk uh, at the Impact Hub in Harare. And um, it was very interesting because the people were all very young and they are all developers or interested in uh, setting out uh, in, in startups, in uh, digital freelancers. So, of course, for them, uh, Bitcoin would be a way to get paid from abroad. And uh, some of them already are Bitcoin users. I've talked to uh, two of those who were at this meetup. They are, you could say, early adopters. And um, I talked with them about the things how they use Bitcoin and how they see the chances for Bitcoin in the future. And it's all in my, my podcast series. But of course, I'm going to tell you here too. What I also did, uh, we went, uh, we did a road trip from Harare to Bulawayo, which is the second biggest town in Zimbabwe. And then we went to Victoria Falls, um, which is, uh, yeah, that, that's the, the funny thing. Uh, people there um, like to name their things like Silicon Valley State. You know, I also saw uh, small combi buses. They have names, those buses, and one of them was called social media, which I thought is very funny. Um, this is Victoria Falls. It's actually a World Heritage Site. And uh, that's the Zambezi River. Uh, it's the second largest river, I think, in Africa. And uh, yeah, that brings me to the point where I have to introduce or thank my sp sponsors for uh, a short minute because they made it possible for me to even go there. Uh, that's local bitcoins, the peer-to-peer -peer exchange that's also used by the people in Zimbabwe uh, because they don't have their own uh, cryptocurrency exchange. They had one, but it was shut down. We'll come to that later. Then uh, Shift Crypto Security, the manufacturer of the Bitbox O2 hardware wallets, then my friend Peter McCormack from the What Bitcoin Did podcast, he supported me, and Card Wallet, uh, the, the storage tool from uh, Coinfinity, the Austrian company Coinfinity, and uh, the Austrian state printing house. And then I also have to name Gotenna because they donated a mesh network and uh, Team Satoshi, the decentralized sports team. So Gotenna, uh, as you can see, these are the devices I, yeah, we could say smuggled to Zimbabwe. Um, I was very nervous when I crossed the border and went through the customs because I really was scared that they want to open my suitcase. Uh, I think I would have got some pro problems then, uh, but they didn't. So I brought this uh, mesh network and donated it to a human rights organization so that they can uh, build their own mesh networks now. Uh, in the case there is another internet shutdown, which was the case, I think, two years ago. The government shut down the internet for the people. And uh, that's a way you, not, you can commu communicate, but you could also send Bitcoin over the mesh network. 
Uh, then some uh, hardware wallets from Shift and card wallets. And I also brought a uh, Raspi Blitz that we set up in the Bitcoin Austria meetup uh, some weeks before the trip. So, and uh, at the beginning of February, on the 9th of February, I entered Zimbabwe. This is actually a faked picture in a way, but it's a symbolic picture for me. That's the bridge over the Zambezi to uh, Zambia between Zimbabwe and Zambia. And um, yeah, I just like the yellow build, uh, composition of the image. So um, let's start with the living situation of people uh, in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was actually the breadbasket of Africa. It was a, it's a, a naturally very rich country. They have lots of rare metals. They have gold. Um, they had uh, a very, they have very industrious people. Uh, farming uh, was uh, so big that they actually exported uh, food and other agricultural product, products to other countries in Africa, but this is actually everything is gone. Um, so you see this uh, railway here, this train, uh, it's still working, but all the cables are gone. Uh, everything is uh, has come down, as you can see. So the country is actually a very rich country, but in the last 40 years since independence, since there was this kleptocracy, this is still a kleptocracy, mm -hmm. this uh, dictatorship by Robert Mugabe, this has really brought the country down. And um, so it's a fact that I was living in Harare and the house I was living in, uh, people in this area don't have water. So the public water system does not work anymore, but still you have to pay for it. So you get your monthly bill, you have to pay it, but you have to buy your water somewhere else or you use rainwater that you collect in your own tank. And also you have electricity shortages. Uh, you only have power from like 11 p.m. to 4 or 5 in the morning. That means that people who can't afford a solar panel and an inverter they have to work at night. So all those poor people actually who work as a maid or as a security guard, or also if you work on a computer or something, uh, you have to do it by night. You can't work by day. And um, as you can see, people help themselves. So if they can afford a solar panel, they buy one. This is actually a background kitchen. Or, no, it was called a background restaurant in the back of a supermarket where we were and uh, it was very nice the the lady of the supermarket uh, she cooks there every day for like it's a restaurant and uh, we ate a uh, mealy meal there uh, that's the yellow thing on my uh, plate and uh, also mealy meal mealy meal is the staple diet of Zimbabweans everybody eats that there it's like uh, rice in Asia or uh, noodles maybe in Italy yeah and um, there are also shortages in the mealy meal, meaning there is no, or it's uh, at a very high price and people cannot even afford it. And then they have to queue for mealy meal in the supermarket. Also, uh, transport, that's also one of these combis. There is no public transport as we know it. I mean, um, I would have been lost there because uh, they even don't have uh, traffic signs. So you don't know where you have to go when you don't know where to go, you know? Uh, so individual transport, um, people rely on individual transport. Um, if you can't afford a car, then you walk. So many people are walking there. There are also buses. These are like semi-public buses where you can drive over land, uh, but, the other great problem is fuel shortages. Um, and I want to show you now this video. This is a fuel queue. So since I think a half a year, um, you have fuel shortages again. And people have to wait for hours. Oh, that's not working. Sorry. No. So people actually have to wait for hours in these long queues. Um, to get petrol for their cars. And they need the cars, of course, because there's no other way to get around, to get to their jobs, to do their work. 
and people sleep there. They sleep in their cars, but then when they reach the petrol station, they never know if there really is petrol, if they can get petrol. And at the time when I was there, the use of US dollar was outlawed. So, <clears throat> of course, people who had access to US dollar used that. So if you know someone who knows someone, then you get fuel for US dollars. So um, people are suffering very much from that because imagine every day you you every day you have to uh, try and 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 get your food, your electricity, your water, your fuel. And then if you have fuel, you are driving on streets like that. So actually, uh, when we were riding or driving from Bulawayo to Victoria Falls on the big streets, you know, the over overland streets, there are potholes that were really as big as bathtubs. So you can't drive like we drive here, you know. Um, and there's a funny thing uh, in Zimbabwe, they say drunken drivers go straight. Um, so which also shows that everything is completely different uh, as we are used to it in the so-called Western world or in the no Northern Hemisphere. So you have supermarkets like that where you can get everything, uh, but you have to have the money for it, of course. And that's what I said before, that's the mealy meal. Uh, there are also mealy meal shortages uh, because the producers of mealy meal they didn't want to sell it for the local currency and uh, they were not allowed to sell it for a US dollar. So they keep it for the next year until maybe they get US dollars again. So living situation, the average income for a maid, a gardener or a security card is about 10 US dollars per month. And of course, these people don't get the hard currency. They get RTGS, the local currency, the weaker currency. A teacher, a doctor in a hospital or people in public institutions get around 200 to 300 US dollars per month. So if you earn in US dollars, like many, uh, like I would say, people from uh, United Nations organization and such, if you have US dollar, then the inflation is your friend because everything gets cheaper. But for people who have earn in local currency, everything gets more expensive. And every day, actually, because when I was there, they said they are already in hyperinflation mode again. And the political elites, they really extract value from the citizens and the country since 40 years. And you can feel it there. You know, I, I, I really felt this. So people are really depressed because they can't do anything about it. They hustle every day. And um, yeah, they, they, they live from hand to mouth, basically. In terms of human rights, this is not a free country. Um, foreigners actually need a permission to report about Zimbabwe. Uh, I didn't have a permission, of course. Uh, they are not allowed, no, not only foreigners, everybody, nobody is allowed to take pictures of government buildings and the areas around, which is always a sign for a country that's not really free, where there's no free speech. And as you also can see on the right-hand side, there's a tweet, this is only one day ago, uh, that another journalist has been assaulted by police. And it was weird because it's also not allowed to do interviews and pictures inside restaurants. Uh, I met this guy in a restaurant and uh, we did our interview with the microphones. And after 20 minutes, a woman from the restaurant came to us and said, excuse me, uh, you're not, it's not allowed that you're doing an interview here. And we said, why? And she couldn't give us a reason. She just said it's not allowed. And so you can see people are scared. Um, so this is not a free country. This is not a country uh, where people have basic human rights. And also you can see that uh, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe and also the government publicly, uh, transparently, like in public, uh, threatens uh, the citizens 
um, for the use of social media in 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 many cases, um, and um, also there are the currency controls. That means you need a permission by the Reserve Bank when you buy stuff from abroad, when you want to make an international payment. Um, yeah, so it's very difficult uh, to to be be a business inside of uh, Zimbabwe. Let's come to the hyperinflation. Um, I was told, so one of my interview partners, she said, yeah, we are in hyperinflation again. Uh, it started in 1980 uh, when there were, the Zimbabwe uh, was independent. So in 1980, Zimbabwe became independent from the United Kingdom. It was called Rhodesia before, and it was the Rhodesian dollar. And in 1980, the Zimbabwe dollar was introduced. And uh, from then on, as I said before, uh, the, the, the wealth of the country really declined. Uh, they got into hyperinflation mode. The SIM dollar was re-denominated three times. And uh, uh, as you can see, these are these bond notes that were given out uh, in 2008, 2009. Uh, we had up to a trillion dollar bank notes. These banknotes you can now buy as collector's items. Uh, one of these notes costs five uh, US dollars. And um, so in 2009, uh, they introduced uh, multi-currencies, basically. So the use of US dollar was allowed. And from then on, the economy uh, could... Uh, build itself up again a little bit. And in 2014, they had eight legal currencies. That was the US dollar, British pound, uh, uh, Japanese yen, Chinese yuan, Australian dollar, I think. And I forgot the other ones now, but many different currencies. And in 2015, the foreign, foreign currency notes dried up, dried up. And they had uh, really hard cash shortages. And so the government introduced the bond notes in 2016 and uh, told people, yeah, it's one to one uh, to the US dollar. And the same happened then in 2019, because then there were no bond notes again. They introduced the RTGS dollar. That's the legal currency now. The, the How's it called? Yeah legal tender. Uh, and RTGS is funny insofar as that is called, it's, it's short for real-time gross settlement. So it's the money in your bank and they call it what it is, a real-time gross settlement. And at the beginning of 2019, the use of US dollars was outlawed. So only RTGS was legal tender. And people were told, okay, you have a US dollar account. We forcefully changed it now to RTGS, but don't worry, it's one-to-one -to, -one to the US dollar. But of course, this couldn't hold its value. And when I was there, uh, it started, we had like one to 23 in exchange. So one US dollar, 23 RTGS. And uh, in these three weeks, uh, it was 1243 then. And the official bank rate, there's also an official bank rate, is still 1 to 25. So this is worse than on the streets. Because the money on the street is easier to use. Because as soon as you go to the bank, you also have this problem that the banking system is broken and it's very complicated and complex to get your money and costly to exchange money. And uh, now with the coronavirus, I think also uh, in March, they allowed the use of foreign funds again. So basically, US dollar are allowed officially again uh, to be used. And uh, hyperinflation mode, as I said, as an example, this is a packet package of uh, potato chips I bought. And you can see the price was 19 before, and then it was 21. And it's the same in a restaurant. For instance, you have menus uh, and there are no prices in it because the prices change all the time. So you have a menu without the price. And these price changes affect 
the people, of course, very hard. Uh, we were in Bulawayo in the municipal swimming bath because I like to swim everywhere where I go. And this bath was closed for very long. And my friend said, uh, this is new. It's renovated. We got to go. And uh, we met a bunch of school children outside. And we thought, this is a competition, a swimming competition, or what is going on? And then we realized these children, they just couldn't afford to go inside because the price was changed from 8 to 25 RTGS in a short, just, just in one day. And so the children had to wait outside because they couldn't afford that anymore. Yes, that's the nice swimming pool. So we have so many different forms of money. It took me, I think, alone two weeks to understand that. So at first, we have the legal tender, the RTGS, the electronic money in the bank. Then you have paper notes, the cash, which are called bond notes and bond coins. But these are very rare. You can't get them. So the alternative is you can pay with your bank card. You swipe your bank card, which is, of course, uh, connected to your electronic money in the bank. Credit cards. Credit cards are basically not used. People buy maybe airline tickets or shop internationally if they can afford. But in the country, inside the country, restaurants, they say, we don't accept credit cards because it's so complicated to exchange the money. You get it in US dollar on your credit card account and you can't get it out easily. So they don't take it. And people know that the US dollar is... Uh, a hard currency, and of course, it's much sought after. But actually, I think the, the most used way to pay stuff is the so-called EcoCash. EcoCash is mobile money. You can compare it with M-Pesa if you know it from, I think, Kenya. Uh, but the thing is, people are forced into using EcoCash because everything else is so complicated. Bond notes are rare and... Uh, Many people don't have a real bank account, so EcoCash is actually used everywhere. As you can see, uh, that's uh, in the supermarket. You can pay with RTGS dollar. You can pay with South African runs. You can pay with US dollar, with EcoCash, or with the Botswana Pula, for instance. Then we were in a restaurant, and we got two bills one in US dollar and one in local currency. So actually, you can, on a daily basis, everywhere, you have to decide again, okay, how do I pay now? <laughs> what is more costly for me? What is cheaper for me? That's one of those signs in, one, in, a, in a pizzeria where they say, sorry, we don't accept international visa or MasterCards. You need these boards in a supermarket because every day you have another exchange rate. Uh, and uh, yeah, there are a lot of ATMs up until 2014 or 2015. They also were filled with money, but now they are empty. There's nothing inside. You can get, get your account uh, information, but nothing else. This is in Chegutu when we were on our way to Victoria Falls. We saw a queue in front of the bank waiting for their wage uh, in, in paper money. So they are really waiting in front of the ATM. I guess it's filled maybe one time. So these are the typical uh, street shops where you can buy with eco cash or cash. If you pay with EcoCash, you usually have a 20 to 30% premium. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, you not only have to pay a fee to EcoCash, but also the government takes 2% transaction fee from every digital transaction. Um, so when we were at that vegetable stand, uh, the, the woman, her husband was sitting right uh, next to her, and I was talking with him about EcoCash and this 2% tax on every uh, uh, sale you do. And I said, and he said to me, they are ripping us off. And I mean, 2% as a flat tax for everybody is right unfair, actually. And um, yeah, so you can also 
pay in these supermarkets with EcoCash, you can see the merchant code on top of uh, the on the ceiling. So every uh, merchant has his own code, uh, and you text basically uh, the money or the mobile money. And uh, also, this guy. Uh, there are many guys on the side of the streets uh, roasting these corn cobs, cobs. And if you pay cash, it costs eight uh, RTGS. If you pay with eco cash, you pay ten. So, some thoughts on mobile money. Um, eco cash can be used on every mobile phone. Also on old phones, you only need to use text and you don't need a mobile plan. You don't need uh, to buy like a, a, an internet package for it. And you only need an ID. You don't have to have a bank account. And even this ID can be from someone else. So 85% of all transactions in Zimbabwe have been digital. I think that was in 2018. And from these 85%, 99.8% are over EcoCash. And EcoCash, the company behind, is called Econet, and it's a private company. There are two other mobile money providers, but they are tiny, tiny. And as I said before, 2% of all these digital transactions go to the government, and you got a premium uh, on stuff when you pay with EcoCash. What's surprising was for me was to see that many people have smartphones. Yes, that was in the town, but also when we were, were outside of town, I saw many people with smartphones. Uh, that was very interesting to me. So the situation is the country, there is a high, uh, there, there's much corruption. It's a kleptocracy. Uh, the elites are extracting uh, people and the country. There's high inflation. You have exchange control. And people are willing to by bypass the rules because they feel the pain. They have to change things. So they use US dollars, even if it's outlawed. Um, and uh, cryptocurrencies are not welcome. That's also uh, a situation there. Uh, the... RBZ, the Royal Bank of Zimbabwe, has outlawed the use of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Some thoughts on privacy, uh, because, I mean, for me as a, as a Bitcoiner and also reading into the cypherpunk uh, tradition, I'm, I'm, I'm also saying uh, we need more privacy, but people in these countries can't afford privacy, you know. Uh, Facebook and WhatsApp are their most used social media tools. They, they love it. You know, you can also see this uh, combi is called google.com. Um, so I would say privacy has to be built in for these people because they don't have the time uh, and also to, 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 to live up this effort, you know. Um, so how can people use Bitcoin there? So you can earn it. There are some digital entrepreneurs I got to know who actually do that. So they work for abroad and are paid in Bitcoin uh, for their work. Um, they exchange peer to peer. So it's funny because uh, it's interesting to see that people come together in WhatsApp group, in Facebook groups, and exchange really person to person with people they know. So they, they build this trust in these groups, which is also in a way uh, logical if you know that uh, using Bitcoin is actually not allowed. They also trade. And uh, in 2017, when there was the big Bitcoin hype, of course, there also were many scams. So Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have a really bad name in uh, Zimbabwe because there were many scams uh, like MMM or OneCoin and people lost a lot of money and they also went to police or reported it to police and to the Reserve Bank and the government outlawed the use of Bitcoin in 2017. And uh, it also shut down the only Bitcoin uh, or cryptocurrency exchange of Zimbabwe at that time. Uh, Golix had even a Bitcoin ATM in Harare where you could exchange Bitcoin to US dollar. 
And uh, it seems that, I mean, I assume that the government also doesn't want people to use Bitcoin in uh, their country because they can't control it. So after three weeks, I went from Harare to Khabarun in Botswana to meet with uh, Alakanani Itirileng, the founder of the Satoshi Center. And uh, she's really uh, interested, or she really loves to educate people about Bitcoin. So what we also did, uh, I brought a Raspberry Blitz and we set it up um, I'm, and, and, and it synced with the Bitcoin blockchain, which actually, of course, is also a problem because Internet is very costly uh, in Zimbabwe and also in Botswana. So downloading the initial blockchain download is, of course, a thing which is rather impossible for 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 regular people, I would say. And um yeah, I uh, did this talk there, also a basic Bitcoin talk. Uh, where then we did a small raffle. We had a lot of fun uh, in exchanging the stuff. And um, what was surprising for me is the thing that Alakan Ani said that to me, that the internet is a white thing. Um, I, I, yeah, it is in a way, I thought, but I didn't know, of course, that people there see that that way. And another uh, interview guest said to me, Bitcoin feels like luxury. Uh, it seems to be made for, for Western people, and it's definitely not made uh, by people who have uh, to stand in a fuel shortage, in a fuel queue for many hours. Um, the internet is very expensive. That means the classical way to educate yourself about Bitcoin over YouTube, that's not a thing for most of the people there. And uh, they have mobile bundles, meaning uh, if you have a smartphone, uh, you buy, for instance, a WhatsApp bundle. So you only can use WhatsApp. Or you buy a social media bundle, then you can use WhatsApp, Facebook, and Twitter maybe, or Telegram. But that's it. So most people do not have access to the World Wide Web. So how should they download a Bitcoin wallet then? And another very interesting thing for me was the tradition of Ubuntu. So South African people see themselves always responsible for their families and for their friends, for their, their, their surrounding. You know, it's completely Different, I would say, to the European or US uh, thing like Bitcoin is a thing for a freedom, a tool for freedom, for personal self-sovereignty. People don't see that there. So actually, it's much more, it should much more be branded or communicated as community money. And the guy or the, the two people I met with who are like early adopters of Bitcoin there, they've never seen a hardware wallet. Because, of course, it's too expensive. That's the one thing. And on the other side, uh, nobody is selling hardware wallets uh, in Zimbabwe on the ground. And you can't really import it. I mean, you need runners. They bring you the stuff from South Africa to Zimbabwe. So what I learned or, the, or what I think uh, are ways how we, I say we, meaning the Bitcoin community, how can we serve better these peop the people there? Um, I think it's very important uh, that the Lightning Network is working and is an entry to Bitcoin. Because if you only earn like 10 US dollars a month or 200, 300 US dollars a month and you cannot really save, then you have to use on the one hand uh, the money, you have to exchange it easily. And on the other hand, uh, it would be very important that people have a chance to earn Bitcoin. And there's a product or a project called Stackwork, which I think is very interesting. Uh, you can do micro tasks on Stackwork and earn lightning for it. And you can exchange it to uh, over bit refill, for instance, to airtime for your Econet phone. So uh, that's a way uh, how people could earn lightning and um, earn some money. Then 
education and building awareness for the good of P Bitcoin. As I said before, people have very bad feelings about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because many people lost much money with scams. And on the other hand, I, I guess with the hype in 2017 and then uh, it went down, yeah, people lost much money. Then we should think about solutions, how we could uh, introduce Bitcoin or Bitcoin wallets uh, over Telegram or WhatsApp or Facebook. Yeah? People don't have access, access to the World Wide Web. Then key management. Yeah? Um, if a hardware wallet is about 80 or 90 US dollars and people earn 200, 300, they will never be able to afford a hardware wallet. And what is the most important point, I think, is uh, that we as Westerners, if we want to support African people to be, uh, in a way, financially included, uh, then we have to collab collaborate with them uh, and not, not go there and say, this is the super product I have for you and now you can use it or not. Yeah. So we have to collaborate with them. There are many developers, many industrious people and support them. Like uh, Ala Kanani, for instance, she said uh, she wants to do a conference where she's inviting the government and all the people and everybody should learn about Bitcoin. I mean, I don't know. I don't think that we're going to have this conference this year, uh, but maybe next year. So it would be great if we could support them. So for me uh, personally, my thoughts about or on Bitcoin before and after that travel, I even before I saw Bitcoin as a tool for financial inclusion and freedom of transaction. And I realized even more that Africa and Zimbabwe are actually the place for Bitcoin. There it could play out its uh, properties, being permissionless and uncensorable. Uh, when, when people in Zimbabwe are really robbed their money, you know, like forcefully changing US dollars into RTGS and then you have you lost all your money. Bitcoin is definitely relevant as an alternative financial system. Privacy has to be built in. It's about community, not self-sovereignty in Southern Africa. So the, the wording should be different. And yeah, Bitcoin is not used by many people there, but they immediately understand what you are talking about when you explain to them the properties of Bitcoin. And it's really making a difference for some people uh, of the black community. I talked also to many white people who are, of course, richer or better off uh, most of the times and I heard from a lot of them they either have Bitcoin or they have lost it or they use it uh, so I think uh, the potential is huge but uh, it takes time and it will be a lot of work if we if, if we want to support that um, and there are some hurdles also, you know, like if you don't have electricity uh, the whole day and you're in a fuel queue and your battery runs out, uh, you also can't pay with Bitcoin then, you know. So these are all things that uh, one has to have in mind when developing uh, products for uh, these people. So I'm not sure. You're on mute again. I'm on mute again. Can okay. you read it? So actually. Can read it, but we can't hear it. It's not routed through the audio of the. Yeah, screen. sorry. That's cool. So. So basically what she says is uh, Africa is the place that needs Bitcoin. She was in the US uh, and she saw a drive through bank and she thought, uh, what you got drive through banks? You don't need Bitcoin. We need Bitcoin. So, um, yeah. And um, that's actually, I want to close with that. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, I hope it was interesting. And of course, I'm here for questions. So my first question is, um, so you talk about traveling to a country 
where reporters are censored, where uh, cash transfers are censored, and you're posting pictures and talking about bringing a Raspberry Pi there and a meeting and whatever. Is there any concerns for the for the people that are there uh, for the media that you're producing or uh, and talking about I, podcast and 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 on our show? I I didn't talk about it when I was there. I saw so before when I was planning uh, the tour. I didn't post about it. I, I I never said I'm going to Zimbabwe. Uh, and okay, well, that uh, got you in. But when, now when I'm talking there, about it after leaving. Yeah, so I, how does that affect the people there? Yeah, uh, I didn't, uh, they are anonymous, so I didn't uh, name their names. Uh, so I, and that was uh, my decision actually, because uh, two of them said, I'm okay with my name in it. And I said, uh, no, I think I'm not going to do that. Yeah, because uh, there, there's a young woman and she was really like, oh, I don't care, you know, and, and she, uh, they, it was, to be honest, it was nice uh, of her to say that, but um Maybe also a little bit naive when I want to say that, and, and I say that candidly because she's she's great, but she she didn't uh, think about that that it's maybe not a good idea to say that publicly publicly, and so I left every every name out, and I'm also not uh, linking people and stuff. But I'm wondering, uh, and that I was really scared also, uh, is if I ever am allowed to go to Zimbabwe again. <laughs> Uh, but I think my media, uh, my, 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 I'm not so widely known. So I think the Zimbabwean government has now other things to do at the moment. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I was just concerned about the pictures and Bitcoin meetup in a certain place. And I, yeah, I called it blockchain meetup there. So because the government is into blockchain, blockchain is very good. And they also want what are to they do with that... blockchain controlling people with uh, immutable data. What's their blockchain trip? Uh, they are uh, before the crisis hit them. Now uh, <laughs> they were doing a sandbox for blockchain project, uh, blockchain stuff. And I think that if then they they want to set out with their own cryptocurrency because they already said we have RTGS. This is basically cryptocurrency. Uh, which of course is not cryptocurrency, but I could imagine that they, uh, yes, want to do blockchains that they control. Yeah, of course, like private blockchains. Permission, permission blockchain. Yeah, per permission. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, with some sort of scam baked in instead of 2%, 8%. Yeah, but something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's a little bit unfair. Um, yeah, it's like uh, an eye opener. Yeah, very much actually. Yeah, and uh, I've I've also talked of to to my friends. So why are you staying here if if life is that hard? Because you know half of your day you are organizing stuff, and uh, they said to me, yeah, you know, but the people are so great. The country is great. People are great. And uh, my you mean, friend also. You mean expatriates living there? Or, yes. Yes. Or yes. Okay. Uh, also, also nationals, because there are, of course, white nationals that were born there. And that's also a friend of mine is, is, is a white uh, Zimbabwean. And, um, uh, but, of course, privileged, uh, uh, like compared to, to the main uh, population. Um, and they said, and my friend also said, you know, here, when I'm here, I, I can help my, my, the people, you know, they also have a worker, for instance, and a gardener and a guard, a security guard, and the security guard uh, came to them and he had a, a, a wounded a, a, on his foot, foot he had a, a problem, you know. And she she helped him because people they don't have medication there they don't have nothing, and so she said you know I'm trying to help my surrounding and that's what I can do and I also love to do and if I go to Europe nobody is helping those people here in the, in a way you know and and um, well, I don't know I kind of like all the con the, the contrast of all the 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 sixty countries that I've I've traveled the planet. And and the the global south. I, I hate any terminology for 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 those things. As far as I'm concerned, America is a third world country. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Anita. 
Um, Thanks for having me.